Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School here in Duluth. And I'm your host for this program tonight on infectious disease, immunizations, including Lyme disease. Please call in your questions on flu shots and other immunization or infectious disease questions on Lyme disease and other diseases you might be concerned about. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Sarah Lund, an infectious disease specialist with St. Luke's Infectious Disease Associates, Dr. Jake Powell, an internal medicine specialist with St. Luke's Internal Medicine Associates, and Dr. Ken Ripp, a family physician specialist with Rader Clinic in Cloquet. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Hannah Fordall of Zimmerman, Minnesota, Rachel Heuer of Lester Prairie, and Nick Reiners of Cambridge, Minnesota. The success of this program really depends on you, the viewer. So please call in those questions and we will do the best we can to address them. Remember the phone numbers for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. And now onto the, tonight's program. I'd like to start out and just give my guests a chance to tell us a little bit about themselves. Ken, you're from, uh, Ken Rip, Dr. Ken Rip is from Cloquet. You wanna tell us a little bit about your practice? Um, I've a, been a family doc in Cloquet for over 20 years, so do everything from deliver babies to work in the hospital to mostly work in the clinic and wear a few other hats in the community as far as medical directors for fire and ambulance and, and a few other jobs. And so. sports. And yep, uh, coaching, a lot of coaching responsibilities for soccer, Nordic sports, ski jumping and cross country skiing. So great. Dr. Powell? Yep, I'm, a, uh, I'm Jake Powell. I'm an internal medicine physician at St. Luke's Internal Medicine. And uh, I practice both clinic and hospital medicine. Uh, I take care of adults, and we do get a lot of um, questions regarding and, and visits regarding uh, infectious diseases and vaccines. So right in my wheelhouse. And Dr. Lund, it's my chance to welcome you to the show and to Duluth. We hadn't really met before. You want to tell us a little about yourself? Sure, thank you. I'm Sarah Lund, Infectious Disease Associates at St. Luke's Hospital, and I have been with St. Luke's for two years now. I'm from Staples, Minnesota, so I feel like I'm home. And I practice both clinic and hospital medicine, and uh, just about half and half. And in the infectious disease clinic, we see all variety of diseases, general infectious disease, and one of my passions is HIV and sexually transmitted infections. And we've been building a PrEP program in our clinic as well. What does PrEP mean? PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it's a medication you can take every day to reduce your risk of acquiring HIV. Good, thank you. I think the topical uh, the disease that we probably ought to start with, we're getting bombarded with flu shots. I finally got one yesterday. Uh, Ken, what is influenza? So influenza is a family of viruses that circulate and usually begins to crop up some years early, as early as September, and then we can see it through the winter and all the way through to the spring. And it's a virus that can cause a fairly significant illness. Uh, they had 80,000 deaths a few years ago from influenza, and it's preventable with a shot. So influenza, usually you have a terrible sore throat, headache, fevers, chills, just as felt like a truck hit you, and usually it puts you in bed for quite a bit. And so it's preventable with a flu shot, and so everyone should get their flu shot. Ken and I practice in the communities that got hit hard in 1918 with the fires, Cloquet and Moose Lake. Mm -hmm. um, so the, Dr. Lund, I'm gonna pick on you just a little bit. What's our chances of having another, like a 1918 event on, in the influenza? Well, it's always impossible to predict what kind of influenza season we're going to have. But based on last year's predictions of the strains that are circulating this year, it doesn't look like a pandemic year, and it looks like we will have at least a modestly effective vaccine this year. But again, it's impossible to predict ahead of time. It's always looking back on the prior season to tell. Jake, I'm obviously over 65. Why, why are you guys <laughs> whacking me with that double dose? Uh, good question. Uh, so the, there is a, what we call high-dose influenza vaccine now that's recommended for adults over 65. Uh, it's a little more potent. The main reason for that is that as adults, as we age, our immune system is less robust, and the high-dose vaccine gives our immune system a little more uh, kick in the pants to get going and, and uh, get revved up when it does see influenza later in the year. Um, a question from Jean here. Um, 
What's the duration of, of efficacy on a flu shot? Is it just yearly? Uh, so it's given every year. Um, we, you know, there's, the influenza virus mutates every year. That's why there's a new vaccine every year because there are subtle changes that take place. Um, we think that getting the vaccine as early as September provides protection through the flu season. Um, but every year the virus changes a little bit, therefore a new vaccine every fall. So when I get my flu shot, am I gonna get sick from that thing? You are not gonna get sick, Ray. You will have a sore arm for a couple of days and you might get a little low grade fever and a little achy and that's not because you're getting sick. I tell my patients this, it's because your immune system is reacting to the vaccine, which is what you want. The flu is a dead, it's a dead vaccine. It is impossible to get an infection from the flu shot. Okay, so one, one other question and I'll let this thing go. Uh, are there are there antibiotics or antivirals or anything else that when it comes so I get the flu are there things that you guys can do for me or not? Any one of you can jump in on this one, Sarah. Yes, there are currently a couple of antiviral medications, and the most well known probably is Tamiflu that most people have heard of, and it's a antiviral medication that is effective for treating influenza if you take it in the first. 48 to 72 hours of becoming sick. If you take it after that, it probably won't be as helpful. It doesn't stop your symptoms completely, but it can decrease the severity and how long you're sick, and you take the medicine for five days. There's actually a new medicine that was just approved yesterday, Bloxavir, and it is a one-time dose of an antiviral medication for influenza specifically, and you take one dose within 48 hours of becoming sick and it's also the same premise. It will help you feel better a little bit sooner and be a little less severely ill. Is that oral? Yes, it is. So Ken, I can get Tamiflu, yeah. and I could just go on it when everybody in my house has got it so that'll protect me? Can I take it prophylactically? Um, if in certain circumstances, if you were a nursing home, Ray, then you'd be able to do it. So if, you have, if we have an outbreak of- I'm in, getting close. If, you, if we have an outbreak <laughs> in a nursing home, we do do some prophylaxis because those populations are so high risk. Uh, prophylaxis within the household, if someone is high risk in the household, I would say probably yes. But if not, it gets a little bit more dicey on weather because then that, you know, that circle can get pretty big and you don't want to just have everyone on Tamiflu. And Tamiflu is nowhere near as effective as a vaccine. I mean, so Tamiflu shortens the duration by about six hours. In the studies, you're not getting a lot of benefit from Tamiflu, but you're doing, it, it helps a little. So, so in certain circumstances, we will treat a, a, around a person with it, especially like in a nursing home facility where that would be, where people are living in close quarters who have a lot of illness burden, we do sort of try and treat everyone there. So, and if, the, and if it's in a nursing home, we try and keep everyone out a little bit to say, okay, let's- Close the doors. Close the yeah. doors for a little bit. Do you wanna jump in, Jake? Nope. Agree. I, no, I totally agree yeah. with that. Um, it's, it's important for us to remember. Mm -hmm. yep. One last thing about the vaccine versus Tamiflu, I completely agree. Tamiflu may decrease the, you know, shorten the duration of the severity a little bit, but it is nothing compared to getting the actual vaccine. And, you know, the vaccine not only can prevent you from getting influenza, but if you do get influenza, it can be a sh less severe disease less shorter lived and keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the doctor's office, keep you out of the intensive care unit, or keep you from dying from influenza. That so, post second, that post stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, very important to remember that even if you do get a respiratory, you know, influenza later in the season after your flu shot, it'll probably a lot, be a lot less severe than if you hadn't gotten the shot at all. So let's put the flu to bed, we'll move on. <laughs> Another one of these things, Ken, you're the, you're the rural doc Sure. Here. So you're out there tramping in the woods and there's tick bites yes. and you get a bullseye rash. Oh. Yeah. And so you don't get any symptoms or anything. Do you treat that or what but do you, you do? If you have the classic bullseye rash. Now, if, if you get bit by a tick, you're gonna get a spot of what I call envenomation where you get stung and there'll be a little red there. But if you get the classic rash and I have pictures that my patients bring in and show me, if you get the classic expanding red rash, then you, that by definition is Lyme. You don't need blood work, you don't, you can just treat that patient. We usually get blood work just to document, but you can just treat. And so you go and just find out what they're allergic to. So, or not allergic so Mike's to. question is though, he didn't get any symptoms, but he had the rash, should he be treated? Yes, 
Without a doubt, without a doubt, because you not, and, and some people, unfortunately, the, the, it's great if you get the rash because it's obvious. The problem is some people get, will get bit by the tick, not get the rash, maybe get some other symptoms, but then, then it, it's a little bit, they can have it for longer. So the rash is a great marker. Jake, can I come and see you and get my Lyme vaccine? Uh, there is, to my knowledge, no human Lyme vaccine available. Well, they give it to dogs. There's one for dogs, right? And uh, you might want to go to the vet, Ray, to get that, but you're not going to get it at my office. We <laughs> had one, and they pulled we it. We did, they yeah. pulled it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for good reason. Yep, that's true. Anything you want to add, infectious disease person? Nope, just that I completely agree. If you have the classic erythema migrans, the bullseye rash, we recommend not actually doing any blood work at all because there's a high chance that that early in the disease, your blood work will be negative and you should treat anyway. How would you treat it at that point? With a medicine, an antibiotic called doxycycline, usually for adults, and there are some subtle variations for children depending on their age. Do you treat pretty extensively or just uh, one time or how do you do that? In adults, the recommendations are for 10 days and up to 21 days for early Lyme disease. But the more research that comes out is more convincing that an actual shorter amount of treatment is adequate and you need not treat for a very long amount of time. So there's this other two diseases, there's anaplasmosis and babesiosis that kind of follow with the ticks also. Uh, you guys are in the front lines, what are you seeing? Jake? Uh, yeah, so we'll see, you know, I see several cases uh, every summer of an anaplasmosis. Babesiosis is pretty rare, relatively rare. You see a little bit of that, but not anaplasmosis, I think, is probably as common, if not more common, than Lyme disease, mm -hmm. at least in my practice. And uh, symptoms typically are uh, very high fever, uh, achy, f similar to influenza type symptoms, but not the cough, achy fever, sometimes joint pains. Oftentimes we'll see abnormalities in blood work with liver enzyme elevation and, and uh, abnormalities to their blood count. Um, it has a very typical presentation clinically and, and in the lab and is very responsive to treatment. People will feel horrible one day, the next day they're feeling back to normal with the appropriate treatment. And that's also doxycycline, the same treatment for Lyme disease. So Ken, just to, as we leave this topic, you're the woodsman, uh, what can I do to protect myself so I don't get wood ticks? Uh, I, like, Besides stay the, home. It, um, it really, what you wear, so if you're hiking through the woods, making sure you're tucking your pants into your socks, light colored clothing, really keep those, uh, those bands tight around your wrists and ankles. Uh, when you're done, a careful tick check. DEET is very effective, so if you know you're gonna get exposed, just, and then they also, so DEET you can apply directly to your skin, and then the permethrin impregnated clothing is very effective. Well, it is. And so yeah, and, now, and you can wash those multiple times and still retain the protection for it. So that is all good. Treating your pets is critical because you, you might just let your dog out and if your dog brings in a bunch of ticks on him, one jumps off and jumps on you, that's your, your, your risk then. So making sure your dogs are treated. I found that by, I have two dogs at home, making sure I treat them, that really cuts down the tick burden within the house, so. Jake, I'm gonna switch diseases. Getting a few questions on shingles. Mm -hmm. What is, what is shingles? What are shingles? Uh, so, what shing right so shingles is a reactivation of the chicken pox virus. So uh, most of us uh, have had chicken pox <coughs> as children. The, of course, this generation of children, are, most of them are vaccinated for it, so shingles won't be an issue for them. But for those of us who have had chicken pox, our body fights it off, <clears throat> but that infection stays in our system. It lives in our nervous system. And as we age, our immune system starts to not work quite as well, and, and there are times where that virus will rear its head and cause a generally a, a rash that is a combination of itchy and, and painful and typically consists of clusters of blisters, more or less. Um, that's what shingles is. Uh, about a third of adults who have had chicken pox will get shingles in their lifetime, uh, more common as we age. So what I heard you say is if, I get, if I'm a kid and I get the immunization, I won't get shingles it, ever. That, that should be the case. Um, those children uh, who have been vaccinated for chicken pox and who have not had chicken pox will not get shingles. I missed that lecture. Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, this person said, uh, he's 79, somebody here in Duluth has shingles twice, should they get the vaccine? Is it one time, <laughs> you're the person here. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Is it one time, am, am I gonna be immune if I've had the shingles? Or? This is an excellent question. Usually you don't, it's uncommon to get 
shingles multiple times, but it does happen. And there is a new shingles vaccine that just uh, came on the market this year called Shinrix. And it is indicated for anybody age 50 years or older. And it is replacing the old shingles vaccine that we had, the Zostavax vaccine that was a one-time dose. The new shingles vaccine is a two-time dose. You get one shot and then another shot in two months. And we've, it's been found to be much more effective for preventing shingles. And it can be given in people who have had shingles. You wait about one to two months after an acute infection to get the vaccine. But yes, it will help decrease the likelihood of getting shingles again. And of note, it is also, it can be given if you have received the old shingles vaccine. So I'm really old. And in the <laughs> old days, the first polio shots really hurt. Ooh. This one's not so much fun. I've been on this, I've had this one. And I think just a, just a quick warning is, yeah. the second one didn't mm -hmm. hurt as bad, the hurt, first one hurt. And we have heard that from patients as well, and that is part of the uh, literature we've gotten about the shot is that a lot of people have reported that you get a really sore arm. So that's probably the one thing to tell patients most before right. they're gonna get the shot is prepare them. 15 percent, yeah, 85 percent. It's a little bit more painful. Yeah, 85 percent of people get a very sore arm and 15 percent of people have a report of severe pain with it. So it's a good warning, but it is a much more effective shot. And, and in the studies, it, what it most important, the sh the shingles is terrible. You get a rash that's painful, but that will go away. What really can devastate people is the post herpetic neuralgia. They get a nerve pain that just doesn't go away. And with this shingles, the new shingles shot, in the studies, they had large studies and they didn't find, they found that no one developed that post herpetic neuralgia. And that's what, as a primary care doc, that's what mm -hmm. we see as the devastating one is the people who are back month after month after month with their shingles pain, no rash anymore, but just still that pain. And that can be prevented now. Yeah, that's, and I think that's really the most important part. How many times have we sat with someone that's elderly? Or the other place is the one that gets on the, on the mm -hmm. eye, which is, Early in practice, I went through that once with someone. That was terrible. Yeah. Um, flu mist, uh, th that's come and gone. It, it's a question that popped in here a couple times. Uh, it's back or not? Yep, I can answer that <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> flu mist is the nasal preparation of the flu vaccine. And it had been available for several years, and then it was taken off the market or not recommended last year from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, but it is back this year. And it is a new reformulated vaccine, and it is now being recommended by the CDC for anybody who would be age appropriate for that vaccine, mm -hmm. children or adults who might be nervous or turned off to getting a flu vaccine because of a needle. So that's really where we're seeing it resurface. And that's, it's wonderful that it is back as a recommendation for someone who may not get a vaccine at all because they're afraid of the needle. I'm gonna jump back to Shingrex real quick too. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems that's happened is that this is a new vaccination that's been heavily uh, sold, it, that's out there, and people are having trouble getting it. So uh, this, is, this is a person to, from Duluth, and. Uh, the second one isn't available. She's had the first shot. Mm -hmm. So how long can you wait in between and then do you have to start over? And as a company, where are we at with this? Have you any feeling on that? Yep, that's a great question. I have saw I have seen that a lot with my own patients. And we have been, if the vaccine isn't covered in the clinic, <coughs> and patients can call their insurance providers. I know it's onerous to call up to see if it's completely covered. <laughs> and that's a big roadblock, but um, they can either call to see if it's covered and they can get it in clinic. And our clinic has the vaccine in stock. Otherwise, we've been directing patients to pharmacies where they often get on a waiting list. And you have up to six months to get the second dose. <coughs> so if you wait longer than six months, you'll have to restart the series. But as of yet, no one has waited more than six months and no one has had to repeat the series. And I wanna go back and talk about something we've already talked about and that's the chickenpox vaccine uh, and the importance of getting it. The question is, is why not, why get the vaccine and not just let the kids get chickenpox? 
And again, I want to remind the people, we just, talk, we just talked about this. Do it again. Oh, well, I'll use my personal example. The problem is the wild chickenpox virus just does not circulate. I had chickenpox when I was 19. I was miserable. I mean, and the wild, and before we started vaccinating with varicella in the state of Minnesota, there was eight deaths a year. Eight people died from varicella, from the primary infection. Now, that's, when you allow someone to get that primary infection, you run that risk of them getting sick enough to die. You can get a varicella pneumonia or, or the virus can go and attack your brain. And so it's not always safe just to get the chicken pox. The vaccine is much safer, mostly because we just, it just does not circulate through the community like it used to. And it protects you against zoster later. And, and pro yes, lowers, I, I, yes, it probably, yes, it does. I'm not, is, is it 100% protective? Because I thought it just showed a much lower rate of much zoster. Much lower, yeah, not Much, 100%. much lower rate. And, and my feeling is that, is that sometime in your lifetime, you may come across the wild type virus, but you have protection against it. And that virus may still hide out in you, but you don't get sick from it. So Jake, the shingles questions haven't gone away, oh, so we're still playing ahead. with yep, this a little yep. bit. So I'm going to double this one. Sure. So <clears throat> can children get it, uh, like a 13, 10 to 13-year-old, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and is shingles itself contagious? Mm -hmm. Good question. So, I, you know, I, I'm not a pediatrician, and I don't know that. So the first question, I think, in general, my response would be, be really, really, really unlikely for a kid to get shingles. Um, theoretically, I suppose if a child had shingles when they were two, they could potentially get it at any age after that. But I think it's quite uh, unlikely for children to have shingles. Um, the uh, second question about shingles being contagious, it is contagious to someone who has never had chicken pox or has not been vaccinated for chicken pox. So keep that in mind. It is not contagious, and, and that person would not get shingles from you, they would get chicken pox. It is not contagious to someone who's already had chicken pox or of course, someone else who's had shingles. They go hand in hand. So it is contagious to someone who's never been exposed to chicken pox, but not to adults who have had it already. Sarah, uh, I'm going to go back. We're, we're still working a little bit on, um, uh, on the um, Shingrix, on the flu shot. I'm sorry, on the flu shot. So this person's over 65 years old and was told that the high dose only has effectiveness against three strains, whereas the regular one, that the rest of you other people get mm -hmm. uh, was effective against four. So which one should she get? The high dose does is a quadrivalent vaccine. So That's it does have it's four same, strains. It? Yep, yep, it is the same. So if you are over 65, the recommendations are to get the high dose flu shot. Jake, asthma, pulmonary hypertension, should they be getting a flu shot? Should they yeah, be concerned? Yeah, yes, everyone, everyone <laughs> should get a flu shot. Everyone. I don't care what other conditions you have, but especially, especially people with other chronic lung diseases. Absolutely uh, more important for them than the average person, but everyone should get it. I tell all my patients, you should get a flu shot. It's not just for you. I always tell people, it's not just for you, it's for the community. So we know that the flu in the community, the intensity of it is lessened the more people get vaccinated. So you're doing something positive for yourself and your community, your neighbors, um, when you get a flu shot. Question on Guillain-Barre, so we'll turn to you on this one. Um, this person had Guillain-Barre in 29, 2009, and was told to never get vaccines again. Is that still true? No, that is not true. So it is a very rare complication. If that was in fact due to a vaccine, it is a very rare reaction. And millions of people are vaccinated a year with a very low rate of getting Guillain-Barre. So no, if someone has had Guillain-Barre in the past, we still recommend that they get all of their age appropriate vaccinations. Um. Lyme disease, you can get it over and over, can you not? Yes, again? you can. You can get it and so treat it and it goes away and then you go back out in the woods the next summer. Next so you have to be bit? You have to get bit again, yes. It doesn't just come back? No. You have to get, and, and the problem is, is that if you've gotten it once, most likely you live in an area where it exists, you are outside, and the nymph stage of the deer tick is so tiny that you could get bit and never know. So more, more likely it's a representation that you have outside activities that put you at risk. Jake, uh, this person had surgery and became septic with a lot of IV antibiotics and 
was very sick during that time. Are there any long-term effects to being septic? You got about 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so sorry about that. Sepsis is uh, generally uh, a generic term we use to describe a bloodstream infection, infection in, a, in a patient. Um, there certainly can be long-term complications from the after effects of being sick. Uh, antibiotics almost always resolve the immediate infection and, and takes care of it, but there can be organ damage uh, from sepsis. Yes, there can be. Thank you so much, all of you. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Sarah Lund, Dr. Jake Powell, and Dr. Ken Ripp, and our medical student volunteers, Hannah Fordall, Rachel Hewer, and Nick Reiners. Please join uh, Dr. Nick Johnson next week for a program on men's health and kidney stones when his panelists will be Elizabeth Johnson, Doc, or Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, Dr. Travis Moncrief, and Dr. Chris Thiessen. Thank you so much for walk, watching tonight. Good night, have a great night. And again, panel, nice job. Thank you very much Thank for you. having us.